I'm Uri Karasan from the city of Hebron, and you're watching Take with Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I want to watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're going to watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, everybody talk about Doug. So and welcome to Taped with Rabbi Doug. It is my great pleasure to welcome back to the show today, Rabbi Uri Karzin from the city of Hebron in Israel. Welcome back to Chicago. Uh, for those of you who might remember Uri, um, he is not only a childhood friend of mine, but his father is my Rebbe. Uh, he was the rabbi of my synagogue, synagogue growing up, and I still uh, speak to him regularly in Jerusalem. He and his wife, uh, Rabbi Nick Ruby Karzin, Rabbi Jay Karzin, has been my Rav since I was a little boy. And Uri and I have been friends since we were young, and it's always a pleasure to have him here on the show. He is the CEO of the uh, Jewish community of Hebron. And um, the Jewish community of Hebron is an organization which promotes the um, uh, livelihood of the city, the protection of the Jewish uh, uh, um, uh, holy places of the city, and promotes uh, also tourism uh, for the city because it is considered to be the second holiest city in Israel next to Jerusalem. And so there have to be people who keep up that holiness and protect it. And Uri and his organization are those that do it, including being the pioneers of living in the city of Hebron and the building it up as a, a, a real Jewish um, uh, place to live, uh, which of course years ago, it was a place to squat more than live uh, after it was uh, uh, recaptured in the 1967 uh, Six-Day War, and it took a long time for the city of Hebron to be resettled as it is right now, and it's still growing, isn't it? Absolutely. We have a um, hundred families. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's in Hebron, everything that you do and you build it takes a lot of tenacity and hard work and sweat. Uh, at the, currently, we're building a brand new building project. We have we're putting 30 apartments mm -hmm. in uh, what's called the Rova Chizkiyahu. And uh, yeah, we're digging. What's interesting about this building site is that in Hebron, wherever you stick a spade in the ground, you're going to uncover history. And we dug about, oh, probably 15 feet down, we discovered a whole quarter uh, from the Mamluk period. Mamlukians were from about 700 years ago. They had in this area a factory they, for glass making. Really? And it's very interesting because there are very many inland glass factories because in glass you need all the uh, materials, the sand, everything from the beach. Sand and water. Sand and water, the silica and all the different stuff. So they found a factory in uh, Hebron and we're in the, currently digging it up right now. Eventually, uh, the archaeological, the archaeology um, State of Israel, the Antiquities Commission. Yeah, they're, they're taking in, they're, uh, they're, they're doing their documentation, photography, and so on and so forth. Eventually, we'll, we'll knock it off and we'll take it down, but in the meantime, this is what we have, and it's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Are, are there a lot of uh, wells of water that they could have been using back in those days, or did they have to ship water from the ocean? No, there are wells. We're, we're sitting, Hebron is sitting on a mountain ridge, uh, but there are, there are wells. There's even the well that they claim they used to belong to Abraham. When Abraham himself used to come take water in the ancient city of Hebron, we still have that well there. And wow. it's, it's very interesting. Very, very interesting. So uh, let's talk for a minute about the Marat Um uh, We've talked about this before, but it's been a long time. Uh, the Cave of the Patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah, all laid to rest there. Um, now um, separated in between, uh, locked up between where the Muslims come in and do their prayer and where the Jewish people come in and do their prayer uh, and the synagogue part of it. And uh, we talked about, about the Tuma and how it, how it, how it dissipates outside of the, of the cave so that, so that even Kohanim can come in there. We've talked about that before, but what is new with the Marat Pela, and has there been any uh, trouble of it being closed? Like sometimes, you know, you hear the, the Temple Mount is closed to visitors because of, of trouble and things like this. 
If there have been times in recent in the recent past that the Marta Machmela has not been available for Jewish prayer because of uh, upheavals, or have things been pretty calm and the the routine has been going where the synagogue is open when it's supposed to be? Right, it's it's not there. It's never closed. Kevach Bed is never closed. It's located in the area, and the three percent of the Jewish Jews are allowed to walk in Hebron. The other ninety-seven percent are off limits to Jewish visitors and Jewish residents. We live in a area A and area B, right? It, it's called it's H1 called? and H2. H1 and H2. Because if, in Hebron, so if area A and B applies to the whole uh, Judean Samaria area. Uh -huh. The Hebron version of is Hebron, H, H1 and H2. Jews are allowed to be in H2, and Arabs are all exclusive, exclusively in H1. I remember, I remember in, in 1980, you took me on a walking tour through H1 together, well, and then we exist. walked in right? Was, but I'm saying, which, what is now H1, you took me through right. there, I remember it very, very well. Right. And of course, uh, in 1980, there was uh, that ambush on a Friday night when the boys were walking to the Maratha Machpela from Kiryat Arba, and uh, people were killed and shot and things like that. And thank God, things like that do not happen on a regular basis or almost never nowadays. But uh, that was a, a scary time. And there I was just a few days before walking through the area, which is now closed off to Jewish people. Um, so this 3%, this 3% is holding. 100 families right now and, and ready for 30 more. Okay, I'll mention uh, it's 100 families, but we bring to Hebron, those 100 families bring a million people a year. In other words, it's a, it's a small group of high quality people that we're holding Hebron in order to allow access to the Jews, rest of the Jews and Christians. But also, sure, sure. Otherwise, it, it, otherwise uh, Hebron would be like Shechem, like Nevelis, where there's no Jewish community in the city, and the people have to visit the Tomb of Joseph, which is located inside the city of uh, Shechem, uh, in the middle of the night, with army escorts and bulletproof buses, and 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 and, and, and a few hours they run in, they run out. Hebron the Maratach is accessible to to all people 24/7. Mm -hmm. There is a section in the cave of Machpelah itself, in the Maratach Machpelah itself, that the Arabs have their section and we have our section. Ten days out of the year, we're allowed full access to the all the other sections, and there are also, the Arabs also allowed 10 days out of the year, the Jews are outside the Matach Bela, and, and the Arabs are allowed access, full access to, to all the places. But you should know, Hebron, now we're developing many uh, different tourism projects. I encourage all your visitors to come to come see us. We have, besides the like, Matach Bela, we have also the, the ancient, the oldest synagogue in use, uh, the Beit Knesset Abraham Levino. Unbelievable, unbelievable. When I was there in 1980, it was just rebuilt, right. and it had just started to be cleaned up uh, and, 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 and uh, remodeled and, and rebuilt. Um, it, it was being used for, for a period of time as, as a horse shed or something like that? It was destroyed and they used it as a goat pen. A goat pen, uh, right. It was it was before like it was claimed by the Jews. We're just moving on. The Beit Adasa, we have a beautiful museum, a wow museum with movies and all kinds of stuff. Uh, talking about the Jewish connection to Hebron, talking beginning with the, the patriarchs and the matriarchs and how they, and the importance of Hebron. We have an archaeological site which we dug up in 2017, it was open, 2017. Um, there we have some incredible mikvahs from the time of the Second Temple. Wow. And what that shows us is this, uh, this area was actually used as, they're called industrial mikvahs. So it's an industrial mikvah. Everybody knows a mikvah is for an individual person. You have four stairs, you for go to the for, for? No, no, this is, this is about the size of your synagogue, okay? Wow. <laughs> this is this mikvah, because it, it, was, it was for um, workers, teams of workers who would go down there, and they, they make themselves pure, ritually pure. They come up, then they're able to work next door. There was an industrial area. They used to uh, provide wine and oil, apparently for the temple. Uh -huh. And all this stuff had to be done where it's all the highest level of purity. Indeed. So you have industrial mix, people go down, they come up, they work. We have uh, wine presses there. We have um, uh, different stuff. There's, there's a factory there for creation of clay vessels because the stuff had to be put into clay vessels sent to Jerusalem. So it's a lot to see in Hebron, and I encourage all your viewers to come see it. It's great. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's really... Uh, if you want a tour, the Hebron Fund, which is our American fundraising arm, they have uh, uh, twice a week, they have tours. Really? Picking up the hotels in Jerusalem and, and coming to Hebron. It's unbelievable. So let's talk about uh, Parshat Chaye Sarah, first of all. 
uh, uh, which is the uh, biggest tourism weekend in Hebron because it talks about the death of Sarah. She's buried in the Marath of Machpelah in the Torah portion of the book of Genesis in Breshit. Um, tell me, how many people this year came from Chai Because I hear it gets bigger every single year. It, it gets bigger. I just want to add one thing. It's true that the, the first line of the of the parsha Chai Sarah, Sarah, Sarah dies. She passes on. But the important part there is that Abraham purchases the Marath of and that's why Arba mil shekel kesef. Right, about 400 shekels, he, he bought it. Which, by the way, somebody researched that, and, and it was a fortune of money at the time. Right. Now, if it was a transfer today, it would be like millions. I, don't I talk. I talk about this. I talk about this um, and, uh, uh, at funerals often for families to understand how important burial of a loved one is um, and keeping the ground holy. Uh, Ephron Hachiti, who offered Abraham any place he wanted to bury his wife for free because he was an important man, uh, you know, a uh, respected man. Abraham refused and he said, I'll pay full price. So what does Ephraim do? He charges him an exorbitant amount of special silver coins, uh, Arba Mayo Chekel Kesef of these special coins, worth millions and millions of dollars, far beyond what the Marat of Achel was worth at that time, the value of it. And uh, I, I do talk about that, so it's interesting that you brought that up. Um, uh, but he never wanted anybody to claim that land and desecrate the holy remains of his beloved Sarah. And so, uh, that's our, our claim to, to, to Hebron, to the Marat uh, for eternity, that yeah, Abraham paid for it. It was wise. And, and he buried, 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 his children were buried there. Uh, Yitzchak, his grandson Yaakov, their wives, uh, at least uh, three of the four wives were buried there. And uh, the second holiest place for the Jewish people next to the Temple Mount in Western Wall. You know, it's interesting that if you if you're looking for a monument in America, and uh, you're looking for who are considered the great founders of America, you go to Mount Rushmore. You go to Mount Rushmore, who do you have there? You have four presidents, four great presidents. They wrote that thinkers and, and, and politicians and doers, and they built America. But if you notice, there are no women there. America has the, the founding people, not founding couples, the founding fathers. Okay, Hebron, the Matach Pila, has found in couples because the Jewish people are a, a, a family based religion. Yeah. And, and, and that's really what it is. You have all the foundational things. And that's the importance of the Matach Pila. That's why people go there because they're going there to build their identity. When a person wants to, wants to connect to his roots, he comes to Hebron. And it's not only Jewish people, which is interesting. We have many, many Christians also that go there because Abraham is the founder of all the monotheistic religions, he's the founder of everybody. So these are things that we do. Our, our mission, besides building Hebron, and making the place safe, and, uh, we, we open Hebron to the world. We, produce, we promote the tourism, we bring the people in. One of our latest projects we just did, it's, it's now under the beta version, okay? We developed this uh, tablet, just as an example of things we're doing, this, this tourism tablet. You go there and, and you walk around the Cape of Machpelah, you walk around Hebron. You hear the sounds? And at the sides you see movies, animations and stuff, explaining all the stories of the book wow. of, of Genesis, from the Brace, to see what's going on. And that just opens up people's hearts. And they're, they're connected to this. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Very, very nice. Um, you asked me a question, how many people come to Yes, how many camp? people came for Chai this year? I, think I don't know, camp. no one can count. Probably about 35,000 people. Wow. I mean, it's very difficult. Wow. It's, it's a very difficult so thing to know. So when people are there for Shabbat, 35,000 people to spend Shabbat, where do they get put up? I know my one of my daughters went and stayed with you in Hebron for, for Chai Sarah, but I don't know where she would have stayed if she didn't stay with you. Where, where do people stay? So, how does so it work? We have, we have lodging areas. Um, it, our city is small. Our three percent, and I mentioned, is not is not big. So next to Hebron, we have a suburb we call the Kir Arba. Kir Arba, the people are camping all over the place. In Hebron, also the areas of people putting out tents and stuff. People are opening their homes either for free or they're renting out beds. And uh, somehow you have thirty-five thousand people come. The, the, the dormitories of the schools in Kir Arba are opened up. You can rent them. It's it's a huge, huge logistic operation. Our logistics staff is like, is like, you know, to the end. We're stretched, we're stretched, and we do this. Just to mention the wow. garbage control and all the different stuff, the little nitty gritty of, of having, having so many people. You know, it's, it's, it's really, so, but it's a lot of fun. And uh, we, we, we joke, we say that the uh, community of Hebron is the first person to make a chag, make a holiday in the Jewish calendar since Shushan, oh, since yeah. I have a poor. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, since then, no one else has done that. We've done it. Very it's nice. beautiful. Very nice. So um, you mentioned uh, about uh, 
uh, the different things in Hebron. One of the things that, that I remember back uh, in 1980, you took me down to the uh, small memorial in some kind of a basement for the 1929, mass 1929 right? massacre that took place in Hebron when so many Jews were killed, yeshiva students, teachers, rabbis, residents uh, were killed in a, a, a massacre uh, that took place. Um, I know that that museum is not still in that little basement. What have you done to remember those people? Because that was the uh, you know biggest uh, tragedy in modern times in Hebron. Okay, well, today, that whole bottom floor, not just the room, the whole bottom floor, that's our Beit HaDassan Museum that right. I mentioned earlier. Uh, we put in a lot of stuff, high tech and stuff, movies, is a, is a, is a movie theater that was showing the, the history of Hebron and like a modern day dramatization about a family who comes and connects himself to Hebron. It's a beautiful thing. The 1929 massacre room is still there, but it's, it's been upgraded by tenfold. In other words, we have their movies now, people talking about it. Those since then, those people have also passed on to, to the next world. But there are these older people talking about their memories. Uh, the survivors. From, from, it's a survivors. I've seen that it's movie. I've seen that movie. Um, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. It's uh, yeah. We, we do that. That's basically, that's not. We don't emphasize necessarily that piece of Hebron's history. It happened. It absolutely happened. And those of us who, who moved back to Hebron, I moved back there in 1984. We're the continue, continuation of that community. But you were living before that in Kirat right. Arba, in the sister right. city, and right. going to Hebron all the time. Right. So you moved back as, as a, uh, you, were, you were kind of in transition, ready to move back when yeah. the time was right. There wasn't a, there wasn't room for us, and eventually moved down. And you moved in, a, you moved into a, you, when you when you first moved there, you moved into sort of a trailer, right. a, a temporary residence. What do you live in now? Uh, yeah, there was a trailer community back then, 1984. For the past 20 years, that we've been living in a regular apartment. Regular apartment. <laughs> Apartment. Like, yeah, that, that's what it is. What, what happened was my youngest daughter was born, and there was no room already in the caravan at the little mobile home. Uh, so we got we got a four bedroom apartment, and that's what it's living to this day. Very nice, very nice. Um, when people come to Hebron today, um, is there, are the people more scared to be in Hebron still? Is it, is it, is it something that, that scares people because of that 3% of what's surrounding it? Well, we have that element, but you know, when people come to Hebron, one of the most common responses is, wow, this place is so relaxed. Like, like where are they talking about the press? This doesn't happen now. Uh -huh. And that's one of the things that we do. And promoting tourism doesn't go with terror. So the time we're taping is Parshat Shalach Lecha this week. Uh, Shalach in, in the Book of Numbers in Bamidbar. And uh, there's a connection to Hebron in it, and I wanted you to share what is the connection as we're taping during the summer now uh, of this summertime parsha. It's not Genesis, it's not Chaye Sara. What is the connection in this week's parsha? Tell us. Okay, this, this week's parsha is, is called Shlach. We're talking about the tragic story of the ten spies. With the ten spies, uh, there are 12 of them, were given the mission to spy out the land of Israel and see how they can conquer it and see what's going on there before the Jewish people enter the land of Israel. And we all know the story that two of the spies uh, came back with the real report. Kalev and, and Yehoshua. Right. Kalev and the ten, And the ten came back and they, they couldn't take it. That's very interesting. Um, this whole story there, the, the Medrash refers to Kalev and Yehoshua as Elu. They came, how they have the courage to stand up against the about the misnarrative or the misinformation, the fake news, what do they call it today, about the 10 spies. How do they have that? They came to the cave of Machpelah to pray. And that's the place where we're fortified with, with Hashem's truth in the Mata of Machpelah. And you really wonder, why, why is it Hebron, why is it Machpelah that gives the, gave those two spies, as opposed to the 10, gave them the strength? What, what was that whole thing about? Um, and we, it's a kind of, I alluded to this before, it's the identity. When a person is sure about his identity, then he is sure his, of his dare, of his way. Okay, uh, what is, what's the matter of what they are talking about? Again, it's, 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 it's the grandparents and the grandmas and the grandpas of everybody. When you connect back to your roots, you know who you are, you know where you're going. And that's the same thing with the, with the spies. They, they had their mission understood. They had their heads on straight, the two, as opposed to the other ten who, who got lost. That's, that's, uh, that's how we do it. Very interesting. So you are traveling now uh, around the United States, representing the city of Hebron, the community. And uh, tell me, uh, wh what are you doing? What are you talking about? Going to Florida, going to, 
to Chicago, going to New York and the different cities that you're in. Uh, what do you say to them and, and what are you, outside of trying to make sure that Everone is, is funded properly and, and, and everything they need to be able to continue to be the, the center of Jewish tourism and uh, uh, the holy city that it, that it will remain, uh, what do you talk about that, that says to people, you know, why, why didn't I think about Hebron this way before? What, what is it that you, uh, that you share with them? Hebron, the word Hebron is connection. And what we're looking is to, is to make that connection with Jews all over the world with Hebron. We're trying to connect them. Again, I was talking about Jewish roots a few minutes ago. We're connecting the people to the roots. That's what we're doing. We're connecting Shammai and Baris. We're connecting everything. Everything comes, the focal point comes to Hebron. And that's what we do. That's what we do. Are you speaking when you when you go around and you're speaking? Are you speaking to people who are in the what we call the Frum community, people who are observant, or are, do you speak to people in, in in the secular Jewish communities, in the conservative Reform uh, uh, synagogues? Uh, are they are they invited to your uh, yeah, to your speeches? And and do you contact them and, and let them know we're here to support Israel? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Hebron is not for one particular denomination or religion or, or it's just, it's not orthodox, conservative, reform, anything. Hebron is for everybody. That's the beauty about the place. And, and you know, people come to Hebron from Makhila and they say, there's certain energy here that I don't feel anywhere else. And they're right, because that's the, en it's the energy of coming home, of, of en energy of belonging. That's an important thing. It doesn't make a difference what a person's synagogue affiliation is. And Hebron is going to feel at home. Very good. So, when you um, go back to Hebron um, and you're working on projects there and, and things like that, uh, is the government giving you a hard time? We're, we're, we want to build a new apartment building. We mm -hmm. want to reclaim this land, which was always Jewish, which is now being squatters in it uh, on the edge of, of Jewish land. Uh, is there still that governmental uh, opposition that says, we don't want to shake up anyone? No, or or are they being more uh, uh, cooperative and, and supportive of, of the needs of the city of Hebron? Like I remember uh, in the news about uh, 15 years ago, what made uh, all the news in the United States about a family that was evicted from their home because uh, Arabs were supposed to be living in that in that home and and they were living there even though it was in a part that was supposed to be a Jewish part of Hebron. Do things like that go on? Things have changed. Things have changed. Um, the proof is the Roma Chiskia building project that we're doing. Yes, it took 20 years to get the building permit, okay? And that shouldn't happen, okay? But that was sort of like breaking the glass ceiling. That's really what it was, this building project. And all of a sudden, the government sees that you can give um, Jewish buildings a permission to be built, and the sky doesn't fall in. I'm continuing the analogy. Okay, and so now it's much easier. Jewish property rights are more respected, and it, it's better than it was 20 years ago. I, I've, I've been in this job the past 10 years, and I've seen the, uh, I, first of all, it's not easy. Building anywhere in Israel is not easy. More so in the West Bank, more so in Judea and Samaria, more so in Hebron. But bottom line is that, yeah, we have building permits and we're pushing this stuff. Okay. So it's not, you just have to be strong. You have to be strong and tenacious and just, just you know, so let me you ask know. you about, about city life in Hebron, sure. for the people of Hebron. Are, are you supported with, um, uh, I know army of course, but are you supported also with police, fire department, things from Kiryat Arba? Sure. Or does Hebron have their own, um, uh. Uh, their own places there uh, uh, for, for things like that, for city services and things like that? C city services are develop, developed or delivered by the air municipality in Hebron. There's a certain functions that are provided for our Jewish municipality, this is electricity and water and the uh, garbage removal. Garbage is done by the city. We buy electricity from the state, from the city of Hebron. We buy electricity from the city of Hebron. Um, but it, it works out. In other words, it's something, yes, we have electricity, yes, we have uh, uh, water, and yes, they take the garbage away. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh -huh. I mean, that's, uh, things are better than we used to. So what about schools? What are schools for children? Um, I, I presume that a, a great deal, uh, you're, you're one of the pioneers, but I'm sure a great deal of people who've moved into Hebron are people with very young children still. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you have the uh, high school children and you have the college age children who I'm sure are learning outside necessarily, 
not necessarily in Hebron. What about the young children? Are there are there schools in Hebron, or do they go to Kiryat Arba, or are they are they bused away for schools? How, how do you accommodate in a city of 100 to make a school and, and make it available to all those children in such a small town? Right. So, in our community itself, we have uh, kindergarten and nursery school. Beyond kindergarten, which is like five years old, so the kids are bus to here at Bus, I'm talking about a five minute bus ride. It's, oh, it's not far. It's right up okay. But And there's schools, there are probably five different schools in Kiryat Arba, uh, a grade school. And then you have two high schools, you have a Shiva high school and a open up for the, for the girls, the teenage girls. And then later on, there's the Hesse and Shiva, and the Shavei Chiron. Kiryat Arba is one of, the, one of the big centers of education in the area. And they have a lot of teachers, a lot of... So and is is Kiryat Arba still expanding? Is it, is it growing there? Because it, it, it was a very crowded city also, but, but they started to expand across the hill. And around. Is that still bit, going on? Not much. Not, not much. enough. Not no. enough. Yeah. Yeah. Not enough for us. Uh, it's limited. The space is limited there. The, also, the will of the government is let here out, but Nesachavon expand is also limited. And uh, But we do. We, we make do what we can do. So you're talking about uh, 30 apartments coming, and, and we're coming to that show, but I, I wanted to know about this. Let's say tomorrow that uh, uh, my next door neighbor wants to go on Aliyah, and he says, we want to go to Hebron. We want to move to Hebron. Can we come to Hebron to move in there next week uh, uh, or next month? Uh, or is there a waiting list because it's a small city? How does it work if someone wants to come and live in Hebron? How do you apply and, and, and get permission and, and actually live in the city of Hebron like you do? Okay, if somebody wants to move, there's an acceptance committee at this point. Um, why do I say at this point? Once our building project is, is finished and the next 30 apartments are built, those apartments are going to be available for sale in the free market. And if people can abide them, they'll rent it out also. So eventually we'll help make, make that shit, we'll help make that uh, connection to the owners and the people want to rent, but in the, at this point it's not, uh, it's not fair to vote. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's, it's, it's tough to do. You have to it's really tough, yeah. try and work hard at it. Absolutely. Very nice. Well, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. I, I can't thank you enough for coming back to Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, it is always a pleasure to see you. I think, um, uh, I think last time in Chicago, I didn't get to see you because the time was short and neither of us were available. And the last time I saw you was in Washington, D.C., I think. I think at APAC. I, at, 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 at APAC, APAC during APAC, APAC right. the last time I saw you. But uh, it's great to see you. It's great to have you back with us. And uh, I wish you much success Thank you. In, in, in your promoting, protecting, and supporting the city of Hebron, uh, the second holiest city to the Jewish people, that you continue to be a holy, uh, very dignified makom that it is. Uh, and Thank you, Doug. People, Thank you for your like important you. work. Your important work and bring the people close to God. Try hard. Try That's hard. It. Good for you. And I want to thank all of you for being with us also. Remember, you can check out our website, www.tvrabbi.com, where you can also see former shows on the web, and you can also see Rabbi Uri Karzin on the former shows too. Uh, if you want to send Uri an email or send us an email, you can email info at tvrabbi.com. I will forward it to him, and I know he'll get back to you personally and answer any questions you have about the city of Hebron. Thank you once again for being on the show, and thank all of you for being with us. We hope to see you next time right here on Take with Rabbi Doug. Shalom, everybody. Well, he's the rabbi for me. Anytime you need, you're going to get married or you're going to die. You're going to see Rabbi Doug. You're gonna see Rabbi Doug. You're gonna see Rabbi Doug. You're gonna see Rabbi Doug on the TV tonight. This has been a Taped with Rabbi Doug production.